and I said, uh, hey, Kate, what's going on with my jacket? Have you been wearing this to paint with? She took a look at it and started scraping with her fingernail, saying, uh, that's vanilla icing from the donut you ate on the way home. <laughs> uh, poetic license. Uh, Lord, let us keep from being the person who doesn't have the education or the good sense to admit when he's wrong. Uh, a good friend who is used to speaking before thousands with teleprompters and confetti and uh, uh, the, the whole bit uh, gave me some advice. He said, the first thing you tell them is I don't have anything prepared so they won't expect too much because that's probably what they're going to get anyway. <laughs> I can see why pastors might not like preparing for uh, sermons every Sunday, especially when they have to be on their game. Um, uh, if I stray a little bit, people expect it, especially uh, with this preface, but they're professionals, no room for error, and a much bigger audience. Uh, so I, I lost the plug for my magic planograph, so I'll have to do it this way. Uh, works out, I'm a great cartoonist, or more like a journeyman copier, with uh, of, of cartoons, so this is what we're stuck with. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is a powerful reminder that who we follow matters. That's why it's so important to help our children start their faith journey on the right path. Sadly, Half of the children who grow up in the church are leaving their faith behind instead of living it after high school. That should deeply disturb us. We shouldn't be content to just stand by and watch half of our children walk away from Jesus. So, what's our strategy for stopping this trend? Do we need more time? Do we need more money? Do we need more fun? Maybe. But what we really need is more influence because influence equals times times relationship. The stronger your relationship with someone and the more time you spend with them determines the amount of influence that you have. Consider who has influence over our children so we can better understand how our kids develop a strong faith they will be living instead of leaving. The number one influence on our children is by far their parents. Raising kids isn't like baking cookies. You can't guarantee they will walk with God, but you can guarantee they won't. Active parenting rather than passive parenting. There will come a point at when, because the Bible says so, won't be persuasive. Be there to answer their questions. I would like to talk about two parents who should have known better. One is Eli, an Old Testament priest with a 21st century problem. An excellent priest, but a poor parent, like a great doctor, lawyer, or investment banker, but not a very good mother or father. I won't tell you about the egregious acts of Eli's sons, but they were well beyond skipping their vegetables. The contrast between God dealing with Eli and Eli dealing with his sons is clear. God gave warnings, spelled out the consequences of disobedience, and then acted. Eli only gave warning. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Correct little, but make it stick. Eli waited until his sons had gone far, so far astray that it was the word, Lord's will to put them to death. If we wait too long with passive parenting for someone else to discipline our children, it might be the dean or the police that fill that role. The second Bible character is David. Slayer of Goliath, conqueror of armies, appointed king of Israel, David of the house of David, ancestor of Jesus. Pretty good pedigree. God's promise to David through Nathan was, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. God was really one kings in the first place, yet he made these promises to David. David was a great professional, but a lousy husband and an even worse parent. 
First was that faux pas with that Sheba we learned about earlier this summer. <laughs> Spotting Uriah's wife from the palace penthouse, summoning her and having Uriah killed to avoid discovery. We can surely do better than that. David's personal prophet Nathan later told him a story about a rich man and a poor man. The rich man had a great number of sheep and cattle, while the poor man had only one little lamb, a ewe lamb. He raised it, and it grew up with he and his children. The lamb shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. But the rich man needed something special for a dinner guest, uh, and he took the lamb and served it. David burned with anger, saying the rich man deserved to die. Nathan told David, you are that man. Hard to believe David didn't see this coming. Later, David's son Amnon super abused his sister Tamar. What did David do about it? Nothing, but he was very angry. Two years later, David's son Absalom killed his brother Amnon for this act. What did David do about it? He tore his clothes and lay on the ground. But all his servants tore their clothes too. Not much. Then David disowned Absalom instead of loving him unconditionally. Later, the woman from Tekoa, sort of a junior prophet Nathan, was sent by General Joab to David with a story about her fictitious sons, one of whom had killed the other, resulting in the relatives wanting to put the killer to death. Blah, 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 telling David's story. Again, he took the bait, saying not one hair of that son's head should fall. In her own words, the Tekoa woman said, you are that man. Absalom returns, but only geographically. David gets him an apartment, but will not embrace him. David loves Absalom, loves Absalom but will not be his father. Absalom is killed, and David weeps. All of this could have been avoided if David had gotten up and gotten after it as a parent instead of being passive. There are about 6,000 waking hours in a year. Our children spend about half the time at home with their parents and family. Kids spend about 18% of the year at school, and most of the rest of it interacting with media, playing sports, practicing the piano or trumpet, spending time with their friends, all leaving 40 hours a year to the church, less than 1%. So, should the church be surprised when half of its kids reject its message of faith? The problem, problem isn't the message, or even how the message gets delivered. The problem is the church has a shortage of time, and therefore a shortage of influence. But, what if our children's ministry strategically partnered with parents in the home? What if we work together to maximize our time in relationship? Our influence would soar, and many of our children would embrace the faith, hope, and love Jesus is offering them picking up half the time. So, here are three opportunities to partner with us, the church, this year. Number one, talk to your children about their faith. Deuteronomy 6 tells us that teaching God's commands to our children is a matter of life and death. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts, impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads, write them on your door frames and on your houses and on your gates. In other words, all the time and everywhere. Therefore, we should make a habit of talking to our kids at home, and our, on our way home and before tucking our kids into bed and when they wake up. Talk to your kids about your faith. The truth is your faith impacts their faith. 
more than anything else. We simply can't pass along our, to our kids something that we don't possess. This doesn't mean that we need to be perfect, just address and develop our faith. A great way to do that, in addition to worship, is to be right over in Anthony Hall at 10 o'clock every morning at the same time there in Sunday school. This way, if you have children, especially the fourth and fifth graders, they can be upstairs or downstairs, or upstairs and then downstairs with us at the same time. Number three, serve in our children's classroom. Before you dismiss this idea, let me explain why this simple step of faith is so powerful. Serving in this way allows you to experience the lessons firsthand alongside your child. You don't even need to teach, just attend once in a while. A great way to do this is being a classroom helper. The best class I've ever had included the father sitting on a child's chair raising his hand, joy on his face, and joining in. This shared experience can naturally last throughout the week. And when your children see you step out of your comfort zone and serve God, they see faith in action. You will experience God in a new way and your faith will grow. As your children grow, they may begin to serve too. Teens who serve in children's ministries are much more likely to have a faith that sticks after high school. The bottom line is our children desperately need faith that lasts. Our church needs to magnify its message of faith by combining our influence with parents. If you have kids, serve by teaching or in other, word, other ways. If you don't have kids, serve by teaching or in other ways. If you have grown kids, serve by teaching or in other ways. Let's serve.